welcome all to the Zoom Marie Antoinette. Uh, well, it's not really Marie Antoinette, but to this uh, talk about the last family portrait. When um, Marie Antoinette indeed uh, was immortalised by the end of her life, when that blade, shining guillotine blade, came down on that long Habsburg neck, she then entered the realm of being the, either the wicked queen or the tragic queen, but certainly the queen. Uh, she's the one, whenever anyone mentions uh, the French queen, she's the person that one always thinks about. And this portrait of her is possibly the one which is the most uh, known uh, in French textbooks and uh, in throughout the world as being that of Marie Antoinette and her children, in fact, the whole of the Ancien Regime dynasty. So uh, what I really want to look at today is uh, Marie Antoinette herself um, up until the moment when this portrait was produced and look at why it was produced and what it was about it uh, that made, has made it so famous. In fact, we're going to sort of see that Marie Antoinette really was neither wicked, she was perhaps tragic, but one of the reasons was that she was living at a time of great social, political and cultural change and even sort of climate change as well in the sense that uh, France was going through um, a terrible winter, um, the crops had failed and in fact this is where you're going to get this famous word about let them, uh, you know, let them eat cake, it was all the problem about there not being enough flour for the people to eat. So what is it then about this, this portrait portraying Marie Antoinette? You know, it, it looks like um, a sort of an average portrait um, to us um, of a very stately woman. In fact, the painter, uh, Elisabeth Vigel Brun, was so concerned about having this portrait placed in the salon that she didn't even want to attend the opening because she thought that she would uh, be attacked or in fact that maybe even the canvas itself would be attacked. And this was because of a portrait that had gone before this. So in other words, um, it was this portrait was in many ways um, a PR uh, attempt by Marie Antoinette and by the court to rectify the image um, of Marie Antoinette as who is being seen as the wicked queen, as the scapegoat for all of the uh, evils of the Ancien Regime, for all of the problems um, which were going to lead up to the revolution. Um, so it is a very, it is a key painting, which in many ways encapsulates um, so many of the problems of the time. Now, I want to look um, at Marie Antoinette herself um, up until that moment, and then we will go and look at the other people uh, in the painting and dwell a little bit on the uh, truly sort of tragic um, lives of her children. Well, Marie Antoinette uh, was an Austrian. She was born, she was the 15 of 16 children to um, Empress um, Maria Theresa of Austria, one of the Habsburg, you know, great Habsburg ruler. And here you have um, a kind of a family scene with 11 of these 16 children. In fact, 11 um, of them go through, it was 10, 10 of them and went through into, into adulthood, which was a great survival rate um, at the time. The idea behind having so many children uh, when you were royalty was that you could marry off the girls to um, other um, dynasties and therefore solidify uh, treaties. And this was extremely important in relation to France. The idea of marrying off little Maria Antonia um, to the Dauphin of France uh, was a very attractive uh, concept. So. Originally, her sister was going to be uh, sent off and she, she died. Uh, and so uh, they produced the last little girl who was Maria Antonia. She had her teeth straightened. She was taught better French, uh, taught, how, taught how to sort of glide across the floor. 
and was sent off at the age of 14 um, to marry the Dauphin. Um, at the time of meeting, in fact, she didn't even meet him until a little bit later, she was taken to an island uh, in between France and Austria, where she was divested of all of her clothes, of all of her retinue, even of her pet dog, and dressed from the chemise upwards in French clothes, changed her name to Marie Antoinette, and loses, theoretically, any um, idea of being an Austrian. However, this idea of being the Austrian is going to dog her um, throughout her life, and it will be one of the reasons why eventually she'll be um, executed. She marries a very diffident young um, Louis, future Louis XVIII, who's a very um, bookish, shy, diffident sort of character, and who will be totally um, overcome by the strong personality um, of his young wife. And in many ways, it is Marie Antoinette's personality which is going to really be the problem if she possibly had had um, a husband who was the king who was uh, more authoritarian um, and it perhaps kept her more in line, um, what happened would not have occurred. However, at the age of he was 15 and she was 14. Now, she had been, as you saw in that first slide, in a court which was regal, but which was much more relaxed than the court of Versailles. Um, here you have the gardens and you have this, uh, the gardens actually echo the concept of Versailles. Uh, the whole thing reflects the glory of the king. It, it swings into uh, perspective from the king's bedroom, but everything is manipulated to the last inch, to everything has its place and, and knows exactly what it's to do. And this is the same thing with the etiquette um, at Versailles. It was a special kind of language that they used and extremely um, uh, rigid etiquette. And of course, the magnificence um, of the court of, of Versailles, which had been set up by Louis XIV. Now, um, before I actually sort of talk about um, what happens when Marie Antoinette actually enters the court as the Dauphine, and uh, a few years later, at the age of 19, becomes queen, um, we need to actually look at um, what was the role uh, of the queen. And this painting is particularly informative. Uh, as you can see, the head of Marie Antoinette is very small in relation to her accoutrements. In other words, this enormous uh, skirt, the enormous uh, cloak, uh, the curtains, the, the drama of the whole thing. And this was royalty. This, um, the idea of extravagance and uh, richness was something which was expected of royalty, expected of the French court. So in many ways, you know, what she was accused of in the end of actually spending money and, and um, using the money for uh, extraordinary clothing really sort of missed the mark. In many ways, it was what was in normal times expected of royalty. Um, but however, the Queen was in a situation where she was simply the consort of the King. Now, at the time of the Ancien Regime, uh, the King was seen to rule by divine right. Uh, when he was crowned at Reims, he was anointed with this oil, and he then became the sort of royal, the conduit um, of, of, of Christianity in France and could heal people. The Queen, however, never shared any of this. And her role was to produce the next generation of kings by divine right. So in other words, her body was simply the conduit through which this uh, occurred. So she was not supposed to have any personality of her own. She was um, the queen of France and the children whom she bore were the children of France. Of course, they were her children, but they belonged to France. And in fact, the body of Marie Antoinette or the queen also belonged to France. So she was not Marie Antoinette, the personality. She was Marie Antoinette, queen of France and mother of the next generation. 
So, and this was also because uh, Salic law, you could not have, uh, which had gone back for centuries, <clears throat> um, there could never be um, a queen of France. You could have a, a dowager or a regent, but never actually a queen. So this was a very, very important uh, point um, that Marie Antoinette uh, will flout um, completely. And this is what we're going to be seeing, that she will take on um, her own personality uh, and uh, go outside of this role um, that royalty was expected to play and by leaving the eternal role of royalty and entering the everyday uh, she loses the mystique uh, and she in many ways brings down um, the idea of the king and the monarchy to banality and to the point where of course it, it can be gotten rid of just like anything else. Now, um, when she was in the court, Louis, the Bourbon in general, um, seemed to have trouble with reproduction. Uh, they didn't, some of his brothers didn't have children and, and nephews didn't have children and so on. But Louis the 16th didn't seem to know what to do. Uh, and uh, for seven years, the marriage was unconsummated. It wasn't as though she just didn't have any children, it was unconsummated. And since the whole idea um, of the marriage to a foreign queen was to have children, which then sealed these treaties, it meant that she was very vulnerable and that theoretically she could also be, you know, the marriage could be dissolved. Um, the Pope could, you know, be manipulated into dissolving it because, of course, she was the one who was blamed for not having the children. It would never occur to people that it might be the fault of, of a man. Um, and so she was in a very vulnerable position in court, um, and in particular in relation to the two younger brothers of the king, who um, saw that if there were no heirs, that they, of course, in particular Louis the, um, who would become Louis the 18th, um, would be the Dauphin, and the uh, if anything happened to his brother, um, he would become king, and indeed, if he had any children, his children would become king. And the same thing with the, the even younger brother, who will eventually become king as, as well. There were other people at court who found her very difficult. She um, managed to snub the mistress of Louis XV. She, she didn't get on with the, the king's aunts. And so she managed to make um, most people um, rather... Um, hostile to her because of her sort of rather um, independent ways. And she, having been brought up in a different court, but not being able to establish herself as the mother of the new uh, generation, and being in a situation where it was obvious that her situation was precarious, she tried to sort of carve out an identity for herself. Uh, and this was in refusing to do things and also in becoming uh, a fashion icon. Um, in other words, the only thing that she could manipulate was her um, external image. And she did this through the kind of clothes that she would wear uh, and so on. And the first thing that she refuses to wear is the grunt corset. Now, this is what royalty had to wear. It looks like an instrument of torture. Um, it was made out of metal. And the whole point was that Versailles, you were not supposed to sort of move. You had to glide, which meant that you had to be extremely upright, almost leaning backwards, particularly if you were royal. You know, there wasn't too much bending. You know, royalty never curtsied or anything like that. So therefore, you had to have this rigid, absolutely rigid, upright position. Now, Marie Antoinette refused to wear this. And uh, this was obvious because at the time um, when the Queen got up in the morning, there would be courtiers there. Each one, according to their rank, would be handing her her chemise or handing this. So everyone knew um, what she had on underneath her clothes. Now, the, to push this even further, uh, she became fascinated 
by uh, the burgeoning fashion industry, which was happening in Paris. All right now, Versailles is sort of stuck miles out from Paris. It's become it became its own sort of stultified world with its own sort of language, as I said before, its own rituals, um, not particularly hygienic in, as in comparison to the new uh, buildings in Paris. And she, a woman there who owned a little shop of frippery, um, whose name was Rose Bertin, came to the uh, knowledge of Marie Antoinette. This was a, a, just simply a woman, a kind of a haberdasher, who had made a name for herself by selling ostrich feathers, bits and pieces that you could make um, a dress into something absolutely extraordinary. Well, Marie Antoinette invites her out to Versailles and soon um, she becomes the official dressmaker um, to Marie Antoinette uh, and will remain so even when she's in, in, imprisoned in, in the Tuileries and would still be making dresses for her when, when she is actually trying to escape to Varennes, you know, the great escape to Varennes. Now, this, of course, um, is rather scandalous uh, for a number of reasons. And the, the problem with Marie Antoinette is that she turns the court against her, not just the people with her extravagance. The court are really annoyed because um, it is very difficult to be received at, at, at Versailles. Uh, it's taken a lot of jostling. It's taken a lot of sort of you know, money uh, and so on. And suddenly, who is there all the time rather than the ministers? And all, it's this dressmaker. Uh, and in fact, she was sort of nicknamed, you know, the, the, the minister of, of fashion uh, who constantly came out and had the ear of Marie Antoinette. Everyone wanted the ear of Marie Antoinette because then you could influence the king. Uh, so um, this really angers uh, the courtiers, uh, not just because they're snobs, but also um, because it cuts off some of their access um, to uh, the king. Now, um, Rose Bertin um, will uh, inaugurate a number of different types of clothing for Marie Antoinette. This one is, is not scandalous at all, but it's this grand panier where you have these enormous um, pieces of, uh, sort of either whalebone or, or even different types of almost like bamboo, um, which would keep your dress uh, out at that angle. Uh, and royalty had to wear this because you took up a lot of space <laughs> because you, you were actually extremely important. But the, um, what is, is more damaging than this is that uh, Rose Bertin and even some of the people at the court um, begin uh, to publish uh, a Journal des Dames, which is a kind of a newspaper which is dedicated to Madame la Dauphine. This is before she actually becomes queen. Uh, and it is published January 1774. And um, the plates which are put in this and which are coloured um, show the latest fashions at court. And um, Rose Bertin uh, had made a name by, for herself by actually dressing dolls. And these dolls were actually sent to the other courts of Europe because everybody wanted to copy the uh, dresses of Versailles. So when you get these publications with dresses, the person who is used as the so-called doll is, of course, Marie Antoinette. So Marie Antoinette has literally become a fashion plate. Now, um, this is a, a large fall from being someone who is a queen, uh, immutably dedicated to the divine right, uh, mysterious and, and sort of out of touch, you know, at Versailles. Here she is just someone who is uh, really showing the latest fashions. It's sort of a, almost a kind of selfie style uh, you know, celebrity driven um, press that we have today. So um, if the dresses weren't bad enough, uh, Rose Bertin and, as we'll see, uh, a hairdresser who she, uh, Marie Antoinette favours also, Léonard, um, are going to exaggerate um, the hairdos of the time. And this is because, as you saw a moment ago, that the dresses were enormous and it meant that if you 
or skirts were very wide and enormous, so that um, if you just had your normal hairdo, um, your, your head disappeared completely, you know, you were all skirt. So the idea was then to actually balance this out aesthetically by um, pushing up the hair and then decorating uh, the hairdo as well. So this was then the development of what is called the poofs, um, where the hair is pulled up uh, under with a structure um, underneath uh, and then covered in powder. Uh, and often this was flour, which is where you're going to get this idea of, you know, where she's accused of, of, of extravagance and, you know, there's no bread for the people let them eat cake. It's because she was using so much flour um, on her hair. Now, if it wasn't bad enough, actually having these extraordinary hairdos, which now, because of the fashion plates, were also um, becoming fashionable in Paris, Marie Antoinette um, goes one step further and uh, enters the everyday uh, newspaper circuit almost, if you can call it that. So in other words, when there was a great event, um, she would have a hairdo which related to the great event. And this one was um, the victory of a corvette or one of the uh, French boats, uh, French uh, war boats um, in the uh, American Civil War. And so to commemorate, because the French were actually helping finance, uh, not the Civil War, I'm sorry, the war against, of independence against Britain, um, the French were actually helping to finance uh, this war. And one of the reasons why they're having so much trouble at the time of the revolution is because they were going bankrupt. So to celebrate the victory, um, she has this um, hairdo à la corvette. Uh, and there are little sailors on this. You've got little, um, little cannons, uh, all this extraordinary paraphernalia. When Louis XVIII uh, has, uh, is inoculated against smallpox, she has the uh, pouf à l'inoculation, where you have uh, needles and doctors. Uh, when there's a, a celebration of a certain flower, you have all of these flowers in her hair and even sort of little um, vases um, to keep the, the, um, the flowers alive. These were extraordinary hairdressers, as you can see, hairdos, as you can see, um, which must have been very, very difficult um, to wear. It, it sort of also proved that as an aristocrat, you didn't have to work because, of course, you couldn't even bend your head down, uh, not even to read, I would have thought, when you've got something like this, which would need to have a very, very upright carriage. Otherwise, you'd go over backwards. Now here um, is a sort of, I thought this was rather amusing. Um, this is uh, what is called a, a pouf à la grand-mère, which had springs in it, so that when you went to visit your grandmother, you, you wound the whole pouf down because your grandmother would be furious that you are sort of wearing such a ridiculous outfit. Now, people couldn't fit into carriages. They had to kneel on the floor or put their head out the window. But it didn't matter. To be fashionable was the main thing. People couldn't sleep, of course. Here you have, this isn't even a caricature. This is actually what went on. Uh, the servant actually up on, on a ladder putting the nightcap um, over uh, the queen or the queen's uh, hairdo. Um, this person already has a nightcap on her hairdo as well. And this meant, of course, that uh, you were going to keep these hairdos or these puffs for a quite a considerable time. You often ended up with uh, vermin uh, in, in your uh, hair. You know, you wouldn't have mice, of course, but I mean, you would have a certain amount of live, small, cruelly livestock. And of course, they invented a diamond scratches for your head. This was Leonard, who was the famous hairdresser of the time. In fact, his brothers actually take on his name because he has so much work. And he actually will also participate in the um, flight from the Tuileries to Varennes. Uh, she, Marie Antoinette will give him her jewels to um, take with him and some of them disappear. He's, he's, he's supposed to be part of the strategy of, of getting out of Paris. Um, and of course, it's not a great idea to um, give your hairdresser um, the fate of the royal family. Now, the other thing that was very um, worrying um, for Marie Antoinette, uh, which she didn't realise, um, was her interest in the Petit Trionon. 
The Petit Trionon is a little palace in the gardens of Versailles. It's, it's small, it has low ceilings. It's very different from the drafty uh, halls of Versailles. Uh, it's an, a place where you could have intimate gatherings. It had been built uh, by Louis XV for Ma uh, Madame de Pompadour, and she had died before she really could uh, start using it. So Louis XVI gives this to uh, his wife. Now, she um, wants to be a private citizen, and this is, this is the problem all the way along. Citizen is not the right word because it hadn't been invented until the concept of the French Revolution. She wants to be a person who has a private life. Um, she wants to escape the, the dreadful, boring ceremonies of Versailles, the levee, the coucher, the dinners in public, when the people, she and the king, would have to sit at the table and eat, and the general public could file by uh, in front of her, while well, Louis XVIII sort of quaffed incredible uh, quantities of, of meat and got his sleeves dirty in the gravy and so on. Uh, so she craved um, privacy and would go out to this uh, little uh, place where she had her own cipher, she had her own little court there, um, meant, went mainly with her favourites, and her favourites were the Princess de Lamballe. This is the poor woman who will be taken out at the time of the revolution, out of the prison and murdered and her head and genitalia and everything will be put um, on um, a pike and shown under the window of the temple prison where Marie Antoinette was. But she would be there with the Princesse de Polignac. And so unfortunately, I, I know this is a bit crude, but this is the sort of thing that people thought went on out there because you, no one had access and the other courtiers were furious. Instead of having access at the Louvre and so on, um, the queen had disappeared. And once the queen disappears, that means that their access to the king disappears and they can't sort of show off their standing um, at court. They have nothing to do, literally, um, once these ceremonies disappear. So they're um, from these enemy groups, as well as just the general nobility, there's great hostility towards her. And you start getting these pamphlets and um, ditties and uh, engravings, which appear throughout Paris. And it is considered that they initiated were initiated by um, the courtiers um, inside the palace, in fact, even by some of her in-laws. This is the most famous one of her as a harpy, uh, and she's called the Autrichienne. Now, Autrichienne, uh, the Austrian, but Chien means bitch as well. So there's a kind of a, a play on words. So it's at this time that you start getting all the scurrilous images of her. Not only is she um, having affairs with, with, with this Swede, who we'll look at in a moment, uh, but with her in-laws, but also that she's supposed to be a lesbian as well. Um, you know, was, one of them was the uterine furies of Marie Antoinette. But there's worse to come. Um, Marie Antoinette was very influenced <clears throat> by the philosophy um, or the ideas um, which were fashionable arising from the philosophy of Jean-Jacques Rousseau and this idea of return to simplicity, a return to nature, um, which of course is the act, act totally the opposite of what Versailles was, you saw that garden, um, and so she um, builds a little hamlet near the Petit Trionon, which you can see today, uh, which is a little farm, you have a little mill, you have cows that you can milk, you have uh, chickens that, that, you know, lay eggs, and she would frolic in the gardens with her children and with these sort of infamous group um, of special friends. Now, um, I want to look for a moment at Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who was um, very important, his ideas were very important uh, at this time. Uh, in his social contract, of course, he has, speaks up and sort of says uh, man is born free, but everywhere he is in chains. So it is very ironic that um, one of the founding fathers in many ways whose ideas are taken up 
by the French Revolution um, are also the ideas that are taken up by Marie Antoinette, but she takes them up in a rather superficial uh, manner. Now, um, he has um, a number of ideas and actually publishes a book um, called Emile, where he looks at the upbringing um, of children. And one of the things that he and Locke actually also in England are very much against is the idea of, of swaddling. Uh, and Marie Antoinette takes up these ideas. Now, uh, swaddling was something which began, you know, right back in the time of the, before the Roman Empire and so on, but it became extremely um, important during medieval times and right up into the time of the, more or less the time of Marie Antoinette, the 18th century, at the end of the 18th century, when it's beginning to be called um, into question. Uh, it was the idea that children um, basically were unformed adults. I mean, they were unformed creatures, that their limbs were floppy and you had to actually um, correct them and put them uh, in the literally straight and narrow. And so while today, of course, you have a bit of swaddling that goes on, but here you had them bound um, on with something like 15 or 16 different pieces um, of material, particularly for the royal babies, um, who were bound up with incredibly tightly with their arms right against their body, um, with their knees and legs completely together, their feet bound as well, and then bound again and bound again, then they, their necks were bound, and then there was something put around their heads so that their heads couldn't move, and the whole thing then en encompassed again by another piece often with a hook at the back so you could hang them up um, on the wall uh, to keep them out of the way. Now, everybody did this. I mean, if, um, if you were very poor, you didn't have very much material. So in many ways, it was better for your child. Needless to say, um, infant mortality was extremely high, as, as you can imagine. Uh, and uh, people did not uh, wash or you didn't undo this swaddling very often, uh, mainly because there wasn't this uh, idea of, of washing that really wasn't considered important. It, you know, it altered the uh, balance of the humours in your body, so you didn't want to get water on your body, but also soap was very expensive. Uh, and so um, infections, of course, raged, and one of the reasons why we had a very, very high uh, infant mortality, I think sort of one in five children uh, reached one year, and they're just the one that people uh, have any kind of statistics for. So uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau was for the idea of liberating the limbs, you know, that the um, and bringing children up um, in a normal, um, well, what we consider um, a family where affection and freedom um, was paramount. Now, the other thing that we need to look at here is um, wet nursing, which was the other thing which was, was prevalent in, in both arist particularly aristocracy, um, but also in uh, middle class as well, and even some of the working class people who could afford it. Um, the idea was that uh, for aristocracy, that if you breastfed, you know, you tended uh, not to be able to become pregnant. This is the idea anyhow, um, so quickly. And with aristocratic circles, you, you had to have a number of children, a huge number of children, because um, they died so young and half of them were girls. So, I mean, for heaven's sake, you, you really need to get the boys and you need to make sure that they um, are going to uh, survive. So they were often sent off to um, a wet nurse. Um, the royal family, of course, had a nurse that actually came to the place to the palace. Now, Marie Antoinette, even for eight days, um, managed to um, breastfeed um, her own, her first child. And this was considered, you know, rather outrageous and gross um, by the court. Now, unfortunately, when these children, particularly of the middle classes, were sent away to wet nurses, uh, the wet nurses often had five or six children. They were in, in unhygienic circumstances and, and people, you know, never saw the children again. And in fact, in Montaigne's uh, works, he sort of actually mentions um, I lost uh, three or four children when they went to wet nurses. Um, it's a pity, but, you know, we weren't uh, overly upset. 
Uh, and this brings us to the next idea of, of childhood. How do were people seen? How were children seen at the time? Well, at, um, at this turning point, at this time of the revolution, as we're saying that this it's huge sorts of cultural changes that are going on. And one of them is very much a change in the attitude towards children. In medieval times, there's been a very famous book written by uh, Achies, who's a French historian, looking at um, the attitudes to childhood in medieval times. Um, some of his ideas are being challenged now, but they've been considered correct for a long time. Is it um, because of the number of children that people had and the early mort mortality, uh, people were um, less attached to their children um, simply because they died so early, uh, you didn't want to invest in them. And so there really weren't um, concepts uh, of the stages of childhood that we have now. Um, childhood was considered basically from the time you were born um, until the time that you were walking around and you were free of having to be fed with a bottle or, or breastfed or whatever it was. That was the time when you were a child. And after that, you became a sort of a small adult. And of course, were considered as a rather inept adult uh, because you couldn't do the things that adults could do and, and didn't really have the, the faculties that adults had. And you were rather useless because, of course, you couldn't earn your living. And uh, in the aristocratic circles, children were often sent out as you know pages to other courts or to be formed um, by other households. And it's really only um, as um, towards the 16th, 17th century that you start getting um, changes um, to uh, the view of childhood as um, less children, uh, children died in not so many, so early. And you start beginning to get um, some kind of contraceptive measures being, being used. And even in the, the, the paintings, uh, of the virgin and child, you start seeing um, the Christ child as, as being affectionately attached to his mother rather than um, actually just sitting coldly um, on her knee or leaning forward, particularly in the 17th century. By the 18th century, you actually have Richard Le Brun here where um, you have iconographic uh, representations of affection and, and motherly love. Uh, and this indeed was something that we think that Marie-Antoinette um, felt for her children. Now I say think because of course the only sort of first um, primary sources we have are from the daughter who survived, who of course um, idolised and saw her mother as a tragic saint. And so of course uh, shows her as this very loving mother. However, this was a very unusual um, sort of painting um, to have this idea of the entwining of mother and child. So this is then this idea of affection. And the children actually, um, little boys, for example, used to always, um, and until they were seven, wore very similar clothes to little girls. So often in paintings, you can't uh, tell who is a girl and who is a boy. Often you have to look at what toys they're holding or to their hairdo or to their jewelry because they're dressed almost identically. And at the age of seven, boys were breached. In other words, they put on pants and then were taken from their mother and given to male tutors, um, particularly in the aristocracy. Well, um, running a little bit late as usual. Um, the, we're now at, 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 at a point where Marie Antoinette is going to make um, a considerable mistake. Um, she has become someone who is famous for her dressing. Uh, her clothes are now being copied in the other courts of Europe, but also in, in Paris. You know, she is the fashion leader. And one of the dresses that she uh, likes to wear in particular uh, at the Petit Trianon is this gaul, which is, in other words, a kind of a muslin dress, uh, which is made almost what we call a sort of a, shep oh, sorry, a shepherdess dress. Now, um, 
this dress was like a chemise when you actually put on those extraordinary um, outfits look like crinolines and you had the corset on you had it over a dress like this so therefore it was very easy for people who actually looked at this painting um, to think that this actually was the queen um, in her underwear um, so what you have here are a number of mistakes first of all she is had herself painted by her favourite painter, Vigile Brun, who was the same age as her, as you saw in that preceding portrait, has very similar ideas to childhood and so on. And Vigile Brun has painted her up close, all right? So you don't have the queen, as we saw in that first image, standing in all her regalia with the crown from which she actually derives her power. Um, all these splendid clothes which represent the greatness of the court of Versailles. You have the queen in a shepherd dress, but only at half distance. In other words, it's me, Marie Antoinette. It's me, an individual. This is a portrait of Marie Antoinette. It is not the portrait of the queen of France, the consort of the king, the mother of the next dynasty. To top it all off, not only does she not have the fleur de lis or the crown, but she's holding the flower, the rose of Bavaria, which was a symbol of Austria. So this was a gigantic public relations error. Um, she is representing herself, A, as an individual and as an Austrian, in other words, not even loyal to the crown of France. She has given away the poof also, um, most of her hair fell out as she had the, the fourth child and it's just very lightly powdered so this is it, it looks as though she's just got out of bed um, to people now when this was actually shown um, it was um, in a room with all of these amazing paintings of you know truth uh, ch chasing out evil from France or portraits of, of, of Brutus or portraits of, of Caesar or something, and there you've got the queen uh, in her underwear. So this was a gigantic scandal. It was removed, and almost immediately, within a couple of months, Vigée Le Brun had produced this other portrait. In other words, you know, this is really what we meant, <laughs> a very, very sort of uh, superficial remake of it. But the queen now um, is in a corset. Um, she's no longer without the corset. In other words, slack. Um, she has her hair done up elaborately. In other words, a lot of trouble has been taken with the body of the queen. Um, she's in this, you know, gorgeous sort of outfit. Um, and she's in an identifiable uh, garden, and it's no longer the rose of, of Habsburg. She's having a rose, but it is just a white rose, white the colour of the Bourbon. Now, we now get to our painting. So this painting is, was produced something like about 18 months or even less than that, possibly about 14 months before the fall of the Bastille. In other words, it's a last ditch attempt by the Queen and the Crown, and of course, using Vigée Le Brun again, who helped uh, Marie Antoinette make that ghastly error. This time it is to portray um, what should have been always portrayed, the way in which Marie Antoinette should always have portrayed herself, as that is the Queen um, and the Queen, the mother of the uh, next generation. Now, um, this is, she is. Vigie uh, Lebrun is using this um, template of the Renaissance with the pyramid, with the Madonna and the two little children. So in other words, she is showing herself as a mother. Right? And that is the first thing, not an individual, but a mother. She is associating herself or underneath it is association with the Madonna. This is, again, um, an attempt to get away from this idea of the um, wild, nymphomaniac, you know, incestuous type uh, queen, which has been published in the um, pamphlets that are circulating uh, in France, uh, in, in Paris. And um, it's also sort of this idea of the saintly um, uh, queen as well. 
So um, she's also wearing a red dress and the clothes that she's wearing, of course, are sumptuous. You know, um, we've gone back to this idea of importance of, of fabrics. You know, the Queen was supposed to be wearing fabrics which showed the wonderful nature of the textiles in, in France, not something which had been imported from England as that muslin had been. But also she's referring to the the queen to whom she succeeded, who was the wife of Louis XV. Uh, the Polish queen, or she's a Pole, she married him, she wasn't particularly attractive, she bought him eight kids, and then she basically retired. And then the royal mistresses, such as Madame de Pompadour, took over. And this was what was considered normal. If the person who spent the money, who, who did all the sort of upfront entertaining, was the royal mistress, the queen wasn't supposed to be doing that. It was below her dignity. So by um, Marie Antoinette, with this red dress, is associating herself with the queen who did the right thing, the great queen um, of the time of Louis XV, Maria Lewinsky. That's not quite right. But also, it, it is an attempt to forget that dress, uh, which had caused such a scandal. Um, also, instead of the rose of the Bourbon, um, you have the fleur de lis um, of uh, the, the kings of France. You have the crown of, of the Bourbon. Um, and of course, she is clearly in the Hall of Mirrors. So in other words, she is not just in some kind of garden. She's in the regal palace. She is the queen. She's also, um, of course, as I said, a mother, it's a maternal image, but also you have this shroud. This is because um, this baby had died during the time uh, that the portrait was being um, made and she's insisted on having that and that sort of was supposed to ring the heart spring, strings of other mothers, um, seeing the fact that the child had died. Now, she's also not wearing any jewellery and this is because um, just before that, you had the affair of the diamond necklace. Now, I haven't got time to go in for this. It was um, Cardinal de Rouen who tried to curry favour with Marie Antoinette. He wanted to buy her this gold, this necklace. He'd been duped by, by someone who was impersonating the Queen. In fact, the Queen had nothing to do with it. Um, and it was a major scandal. But because her name was connected to it, it didn't matter, the mud stuck. Anyhow, so when she is actually produced here, she is not wearing any necklace and she's not wearing any diamonds. She's wearing um, just pearls. So all, all of these things are in... Oh, and there's one other thing that we needed to look at too. Um, this um, cabinet over here is actually a jewel, a, a huge jewel box. And this is reference also to the fact that uh, Cornelia, one of the great Roman matrons, when she was asked to show her jewels to one of the senators, said um, she brought out her children and said, these are my jewels. So that's why you've actually got a jewel box there, um, referring to this idea of Marie Antoinette um, bringing forward her jewels. Now, I haven't left myself much time for the fate of the royal children, unfortunately. Um, the first one I want to very briefly dispatch is, is the last born, who is um, Madame Sophie Beatrix, who dies um, less than one, when, one year old from tuberculosis. So that's the youngest one who dies. The second one is the Dauphin Louis-Joseph de Bourbon. Now, this is this little boy here who um, there was great rejoicing, of course, when he was born. Um, finally, you know, this was about nine years after um, they had, my Antoinette had been married. This is a very long time to wait. The daughter had been born. Great rejoicing with a, a little boy. However, he starts to um, have a number of fevers and, in fact, will develop um, bone um, tuberculosis. Uh, and by the time this portrait is painted, he wouldn't have been able to stand upright. As you can see, he'd be seven because he's actually wearing um, breeches, he's wearing clothes. And in fact, he will die um, during the time that uh, Louis XVIII has, has ordered the Estates General to be convoked um, for to discuss uh, tax revisions. So the, this, again, is a terrible time for the, the king and the queen. They, he, absolutely in mourning um, during this time. These are um, portraits of this little boy. Now, let's face it, these 
do not look like the children. This was an idealised idea of beauty, large blue eyes, porcelain complexion uh, and round face. Now, this little boy is the one that I'm going to be concentrating on a little bit more. Um, he um, becomes the Dauphin um, when his older brother dies. Now, um, he was his mother's favourite in many ways. He seemed to have a different personality from the other children. She called him her chou d'amour. He was a very lively little child. And he lived um, for four years in a gilded cage out at, at, at uh, Versailles. Now, it is possibly considered that he is the son um, of a, a, a courtier, Persson, the Swedish diplomat who was devoted to Marie Antoinette and who would continue to be devoted to her even when she's in the temple, even after the king is executed and will try to orchestrate, in fact, tries to orchestrate their flight to Varennes uh, and uh, to orchestrate um, the monarchs of Europe to, to invade France to release her. Um, this is the speculation has grown rapidly now because we actually have um, letters between the two of them uh, where uh, parts of them have been heavily, heavily scored out by the family of Fersan. And now with um, technology, um, if it's the same ink, we can actually see what is written underneath. And um, there are great declarations of love and so on underneath. But mm, uh, would they ever have been alone enough time to actually, you know, get together to have the child? It's rather remote, but anyway, there, that is one of the speculations. So here is this little boy. Now, um, he's four years old when um, the women, the fish women, come to Versailles, march on Versailles, uh, break into the courtyard, um, eventually break into the palace. Um, he's snatched out of his bed at night by, by his mother into a secret passage. Um, finally, they will be taken back to uh, imprisonment uh, in Paris. He has to jump over the dead bodies. Um, you know, people have been, throats have been slit at the age of four to get into the carriage. Uh, the heads of, of his favourite servants are sort of being um, on pikes as he goes in with people yelling through the windows at him. So he's already a rather traumatised child. Um, he lives um, then in the Tuileries Palace for three years uh, until the Marie Antoinette family decides that she's, they're going to orchestrate an escape. They could have escaped at earlier times, but she and the king had decided not to. Marie Antoinette, of course, makes the ghastly decision of having to have a huge number of dresses made. In other words, everyone would know that she was planning something. Um, and of course, to have um, take all these dresses, you have to have a very heavy carriage uh, rather than getting into three very small carriages or the king actually getting on a horse and, and, and going out. No, they had to clobber along in this enormous carriage. She, um, they're all disguised, waiting for her in the carriage. She gets lost as she comes out in disguise and, and then delays the whole thing for half an hour, which means that then when they get to the first post where they're supposed to change horses, the horses are no longer there. There's a whole series of, of sort of, um, you know, mishaps, and which means that they are actually caught at Varennes and returned. They're now um, put into the Tuileries. The Tuileries Palace is invaded. Again, there's uh, incredible bloodshed, a massacre of the guards that the little boy sees, and they are put into the temple prison, the temple um, which originally belonged to the Knights Templar. This is what it was like here. Now, um, while they're in the um, the temple, they're in this tiny little room. The whole family actually they have, I think, one large room, well, large-ish, um, where they all sleep. The king then, of course, is they just is voted, it's just voted that he will be executed, so he is taken away from his family. Uh, and then it is decided that the if the king's disappeared, that's okay, but the little dauphin is a problem. Um, he needs to be guarded more carefully or the royalists will get him out of the temple. So he is taken away, pulled from the arms of, of Marie Antoinette and 
put downstairs with um, a revolutionary fellow who's a rough character, who's a shoemaker, who is supposed to turn him into a revolutionary little boy, into a revolutionary citizen. Now, according to the memoirs um, of his sister, um, uh, he was beaten very badly and abused and, you know, prostitutes were brought in to infect him and all of this sort of thing. In actual fact, they will um, manage to force him to sign a document saying that his mother had an incestuous relationship with him and it will be this that actually at the final uh, nail in the coffin of Marie Antoinette when she is brought to trial that she... Um, had this incestuous relationship and the little boy had testified to it. He, um, eventually, um, he, uh, they decide that he needs to be under even much stronger lock and key. Uh, and um, he's put in a very small room by himself uh, with the walls of five feet thick. There is very little light. No one visits him. Um, his food is shoved through a little trap door. No one cleans his cell. And so for about, a, I think it'd be about 18 months, he is left there virtually in the dark. No one speaks to him uh, and the, the, all the excrement and uh, food and is, is just left to rot. Um, finally, when Robespierre falls, uh, the next people from the government come in, a doctor comes in and is, is shocked at the state of this child who is now um, incapable of speaking. And, and this is where this is what's going to, this idea of the substitution is going to come in. It appears to be that he's a deaf mute. Uh, he can't understand and he can't speak. Um, he has terrible sort of swellings all over. He's, he's a ghastly colour. Uh, he's covered in lice uh, and, and sores and so on. Um, he will eventually die uh, and uh, his body is taken out and buried at night and, so, and no one has ever actually found the body. The, the number of, even during the, the restoration, people have looked for it and never found it, which meant, of course, that um, there were a number of um, um, sightings of them. In fact, there were 100 people who came forward during the time of the restoration of the monarchy saying that they were the little lost um, dauphin. Um, one of them, the, some of them were, were very credible. Uh, in fact, they managed to even sort of set up their own court in prison. They were taken to court, put in prison. Uh, the most credible of them um, was the uh, there was one called the Duc de Richemont, who was actually at his trial. He'd managed to have he'd even set up a court with his own ministers. He was being, um, he was on trial and somebody came into the audience uh, and uh, read out a, a, a piece of paper saying, I am the real uh, uh, Louis the Dauphin uh, and not the one that's on trial. And this person then calls himself Louis Charles de Normandie. He'd come from Russia. He couldn't speak any French, but he had incredible uh, knowledge of what had gone on at Versailles. Um, he even managed to convince his old nurse that he was, that was him. He had all the right smallpox marks. Um, he could remember, you know, when he wore different pieces of clothing and so on. Uh, and many of the ministers who actually had served at the time um, believed that he was, uh, in fact, the, the lost dauphin. Um, however, his sister would always refuse to see him. Um, she will never um, accept any of these um, false uh, people. Now, what happens is that... Um, during the time when he, the body of this little deaf mute was actually removed from the temple, um, an autopsy was carried out by a doctor and the doctor had actually taken the heart uh, and he'd kept it because he thought that, that later on after the revolution uh, he would be able to give it back perhaps to some descendants. Uh, which, in fact, um, he did, and it was only recently, I mean, I think it's only something like 10 or 15 years ago that this heart came um, into the possession um, of the French state. Uh, and it was then um, buried uh, with the, um, uh, the remains of, so-called remains of, of, of the, his the little boy's father. Now, what they have done now is actually um, taken the DNA from 
this uh, uh, part and compared it with um, DNA from descendants of Marie Antoinette. And they've actually proved that this little boy uh, who died in the um, temple actually was um, the Dauphin. However, this particular, um, the one that I, the Duke de, uh, what was his name, uh, Normandy, uh, his descendants still claim that uh, they are the real people uh, who should be on the throne, real pretenders. Um, and there is, there is actually, they have taken DNA also from um, the remains of this particular person, and they are not a perfect match, but they are not far. Um, so there's always this continued mystery. Now, unfortunately, I have, have gone over time, but I just want to now look at the last of these people. This is the only one who survives, who is uh, Madame Royale, Mousseline Serieuse, um, who uh, is taken, she suffers during the time of the temple. Her mother, of course, is taken out and executed. She doesn't know that. Um, her aunt is taken from her and executed, and she remains alone um, for 18 months in the tower. Now, she is treated better. Uh, she has two books to read. She refuses to speak to her guards. And finally, because she's just, there's no threat, she can't ever actually become queen, um, it is decided once the revolution is over and the directory is in place that she should be allowed to go back to her relatives in Vienna. And so on the uh, eve of her 17th birthday, she um, is released and um, goes back to, um, to Vienna. And again, I um, won't really have time to, to talk about this very much. There's another idea of a mystery that, you know, was it really her? Um, because another person surfaces at this time called the Dark Countess, who um, it's referred to always by the person who's with her as your grace, who always speaks French, who lives in the middle of Germany, who always is veiled. Uh, and when she dies, that they see that much of her uh, furniture, etc., has the um, royal fleur de lis on it. And um, only very recently, I think it's about 10 years ago, um, again, they have taken um, DNA from, they've dug up the Dark Countess and taken her DNA um, to prove that, in fact, she's not um, the the young princess. And the reason that was thought was because Marie Antoinette had actually adopted a number of children, one of whom was exactly the same age as, as uh, Marie Therese and who looked very like her. And the thought was that maybe Marie Therese had been raped uh, or had, you know, even was even pregnant or something while she was in the temple, or she was so traumatised that she could not continue um, uh, in a public role. But that, of course, has been disproved. So uh, she now, um, Louis the 17th would have been the little boy. So now um, she goes in, this Madame Royale goes into exile with her uncle, um, who the brother um, of her, you know, her father, who will become Louis the 18th. Uh, and she is persuaded to marry his son. Um, in other words, she marries her cousin, uh, and that this was she's persuaded by saying that this is what her father and mother wanted. Now he is the son of the other brother who will come to power. So um, she looks like a pretty much a tough nut. She will have no children either, as Louis the Eighteenth has no children, uh, and she goes from one being hosted by one royal family or aristocratic family to another. She goes to Vienna and then she leaves that to go to Latvia as the guest of, of the Russian aristocracy. Then she goes to Britain to Hartwell House where she they hold a sort of court with all of the um, <clears throat> members of, of the family um, who were in exile. Um, comes back to Paris um, at the defeat of Napoleon. Uh, and then, of course, Napoleon comes back from the Isle of Elba and she and the, the royal family go back to Britain. Napoleon is defeated at Waterloo and she comes back um, uh, as, you know, the niece um, of the king. And uh, Louis XVIII makes a great fuss of her because uh, she, you know, 
he will uh, he was hoping because he has no children that she will be uh, and her his his nephew other nephew will actually succeed him so he he takes you know the jewelry that uh, Napoleon had made for his second wife and reforms it for her uh, and together they set up um, memorials to uh, the dead king uh, and queen and in fact um, this girl uh, Madame Royale or Marie-Thérèse will spend her entire life sort of uh, as a kind of martyr um, to, uh, to France, you know, that she, she is seen as, you know, the tragic child and spends her entire life very, very, you know, religious, um, praying to, uh, you know, for the souls of Marie Antoinette and, and of the king. Um, to a, an obsessive po uh, point of view, I mean, obviously it's awful having your parents um, guillotined, but um, this is at a time when people lived often having both one's parents disappearing for one form or another, but she clearly was, uh, you know, traumatised and obsessed by it. Well, when her uncle, Louis XVIII, dies, his brother, Charles X, takes over, and Charles X, of course, is her uncle and her father-in-law. So it means that she is now, if he has no more children, um, she will, his, you know, his, um, when he dies, uh, her husband will become king and she will become the queen consort. So um, in other words, she will have uh, lived up as, as in royalty from 1814 until 1830, uh, when um, Charles X is driven out of Paris in the 1830 revolution. Uh, she then goes back into exile and uh, she goes, first of all, back to England uh, and there's a bit of an embarrassment there for the... Um, the monarchy, because the monarch, the British monarchs now um, want to um, become uh, sort of on better terms with Louis Philippe, who's taken over. So she goes up to um, Edinburgh, and you can see that they are not glamorous quarters up up in um, this uh, part of, of of Edinburgh. In fact, I even stayed very close to here. Um, she then goes from here to Prague as <clears throat> guests of relatives. And finally, on, on to Vienna, uh, where she uh, will uh, remain for some time and then will finally die uh, in uh, an area which is now in, uh, in, in Italy. Her husband will have died. She has no children, uh, as we can see. So this really then is the fate um, of these of these children, um, one who is a sort of sees herself as a martyr, one who really does die a tragic death, and the other who dies, uh, other two who die of tuberculosis. So three of the four die of some form of tuberculosis. I just want to very quickly um, look at the painter um, Vichy Le Brun, uh, who was the favourite painter, portrait painter of Marie Antoinette. They were the same age, they had the same sort of tastes. Here you see um, uh, Vigée Le Brun, you can see her influence on Marie Antoinette, um, very much in the same Gaulle uh, outfit, and the same hairdo, the sort of value of simplicity. Um, she became one of the great painters of royalty uh, throughout Europe. Um, a, an amazing career, really. She uh, rose to become accepted uh, in the academy, one of the few women who was accepted, uh, mainly through uh, the work of Marie Antoinette. Uh, she um, manages to always portray women as, as affectionate and beautiful, and if they're not beautiful, she does the portrait from behind. But she was also created a little bit of a scandal in the fact that she actually was one of the first people to portray people smiling. And um, a smile uh, was not something which was considered normal in a portrait. Uh, and in fact, it certainly wasn't even photography uh, in the first photographs because it took so long uh, for the photograph to be taken. But here um, in the iconography up until this time, um, people who had their mouths open were usually sort of peasants, you know, as in, you know, the Bruegels and so on, 
or in religious iconography, often the devil was the one who always had his mouth open and his teeth showing. So this idea of the smile uh, and the open mouth smile was something for which she was very criticised. But here again, you see her emphasising this idea of the, the very strong bond between um, the, the mother and, uh, and daughter. Now, she also is going to write her memoirs, as does uh, Marie-Thérèse. So these are these uh, documents that show Marie-Antoinette in this extraordinary great light as, you know, the great mother uh, and so on. Now, um, Vichy Le Blanc um, read the tea leaves much better than uh, her royal patroness. And uh, once the royal family were imprisoned in the Tuileries, uh, she uh, left Paris and her husband um, almost immediately divorced her because he didn't want to have anything to do with someone who had been so connected with the uh, royal family. So she then um, starts a traveling around Europe, going from one royal court to the next. And um, the portraits of um, everyone who was royal at the time uh, uh, are on show in her work. So she goes, first of all, down to Naples, where she uh, portrays, uh, and Sicily, where she portrays the sister of Marie Antoinette. Um, the other thing that I've forgotten to say to you in, in that early portrait that we're discussing is that she also managed to make Marie Antoinette not look too much like a Habsburg. You know, the Habsburgs were famous for their bulgy eyes, their big nose and their extraordinary jaw. Uh, and uh, Vigil Lebrun manages to attenuate this and she's done the same thing here, even though you've got the very long face, um, you don't have them immediately recognisable as a hated Habsburg. She also um, paints uh, Lady Hamilton, who does these amazing charades that you know everyone on the Grand Tour wanted to go and see. When she leaves um, Naples, she then goes up to Rome, and from Rome goes through into um, Austria, where she uh, paints the beautiful ladies of the Viennese court. Um, in many ways. She's a little bit like Winterhalter of the Second Empire. You know, you, every, they all look a bit alike. I wouldn't have minded having my portrait done by her. She also um, goes to Russia, where she uh, paints most of the duchesses, uh, hundreds, hundreds of portraits that she manages to get through. And she's fated in all of these courts, you know, as, as being someone who was close to Marie Antoinette, close to the tragic queen, um, the favourite painter of the tragic queen, and so on. Uh, and these, of course, are the granddaughters of Catherine I. She has to actually paint in the sleeves because uh, it was considered a bit risque having no sleeves in your dress. She, these are some of the, um, you know, countesses there, of course, very often you get this mother, Madonna and child style painting. She then manages to make it to England where she modifies her palette to suit the um, taste of the British, uh, well, not just court, but the British aristocracy. And uh, here you have one of the pits. She then manages to make it back to France where she finds that she doesn't have much money because her husband has divorced her and seems to have taken her estate with her. So she has to work, but um, Napoleon comes to the party. He uh, is very keen to have his family painted by someone who was, you know, the painter of the court because Napoleon wants to set up his own dynasty by now and wants royal style paintings. So um, through gritted teeth, um, this rather snobbish Vigée Le Brun paints uh, Caroline, the youngest uh, sister of Napoleon. Um, she complains very much in her memoirs that she's not at all like the old aristocracy, that she keeps changing her hairstyle and she arrives late and she moves and you know she's you know she doesn't speak French very well and so on but you, you get this same sort of thing with the little girl looking adoringly up um, at uh, her, her mother. Um, 
at the end of her life, um, she, Vichy Le Bain, is still devoted to the Queen and produces this um, portrait from memory, a post posthumous portrait of what she really saw the Queen as being like before she had her finery put on and so on. Um, and this is this idea of the Queen, natural beauty with a porcelain uh, skin, uh, beautiful blue eyes and, and sort of strawberry blonde hair. Michel Lebrun, again, um, very daringly, I mean, I think she, you know, this is worth a lecture in itself, um, manages to paint herself as a painter, uh, as a, ma a male painter would, um, but also, again, sporting the open mouth smile, even as she fixes um, us, the, the viewer. So we come back then to the picture that we have been looking at, which now is where it was supposed to be. During the revolution, it was hidden uh, in, in the basement of the, uh, of, of the uh, of Versailles. Uh, it hadn't suffered when it was shown at the Salon, but now it's where it was originally supposed to be. In fact, not quite in the same room it was supposed to be in the Salon de Mars. But it depicts then the last portrait um, of this doomed family of either the wicked queen or the tragic queen. But it's now here in Versailles, which will never be inhabited again by royalty after this particular family left. So I think this portrait of the family is extremely important as it encapsulates uh, that moment in time where the royal family is scrabbling to re-establish uh, its credentials, or Marie Antoinette is trying to do that, and is scrabbling to hold on to Versailles. It's a painting which was ineffective politically, but I think is very effective artistically. Thank you very much.